Shalom, I am Boyisquit and today I am finishing up one of my projects that I began in early 2012. This is an emulator for the DCPU 16. What is this DCPU then? It's a virtual hardware and operating system designed by Marcus Persson, well known for creating the game of Minecraft. The DCPU 16 is the system that the computers are running in the spaceships of the OX10C game. The game OX10C was supposed to be a sandbox science fiction game that includes engineering, space battles, seamless space to planet transitions, mining and trading, laser guns, and an open universe with both single player and multiplayer var variants, according to Wikipedia. What happened though was that while I was sitting on this project without working on it for more than a year, Mu Yeng, the company run by Mr. Parson, halted the development of the game, making it indefinitely shelved. Consequently, most community efforts at DCPU 16 development were also halted. Well, I had begun creating my emulator and I wanted to finish it because it still makes for a good YouTube video and in January 2014 I spent two intense weeks finishing it up. What you see here is a tool assisted video that shows the development from beginning to end including the different phases it went through but with none of those errors that would make the video so much longer and more boring to watch. I also appear to be typing it very quickly, but this is just an illusion. True, the clock on the screen proves that all this happened in real time, but it is not me typing it. It is a robot I programmed for that purpose, or rather than a robot, a TSR program, supplying the input to the editor as a background program. Rest assured, it is me who designed this program and the entire editing process from beginning to end though. Where possible, I also show the original documentation that I was directly interpreting. You see, the central processing unit, CPU for short, of the DCPU 16 is quite simple. It makes for an excellent beginner's project, in my opinion, for those who want to try emulation and for those who want to study assembler programming and other similar low-level topics. Right here, for instance, you can see that I have barely gotten past the introduction in my narration and I have already finished programming the emulation for all the instructions of the processor. What happens next is dealing with all the operands called values in the official documentation you see on the right highlighted in green. Maybe you are not playing the video in high definition, but at least you can see the pretty colors, assuming you are not colorblind too. In that case, I apologize. This expression in the switch statement may look confusing. It includes the ternary operation that I hear often causes confusion for those who have not encountered it often. What it does here is this. If the input number V is between 18 and 1F in hexadecimal inclusive, it chooses the expression V and 7 XOR skipping. Otherwise it chooses the expression 8 plus V divided by 8. V and 8 chooses the lowest 3 bits of V. These values expand into the enum values pop, peak, push and so on until mem lit for a total of 8. The XOR skipping in it ensures that when skipping is active, pop will never be chosen because it changes SP. When skipping is active, the sequence 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 is transformed into the sequence 1, 0, 3, 2, 5, 4, 7, 6. The V divided by 8 in the second part of the expression chooses a value based on the category of the value that changes every 8 values. And the 8 plus part skips over the 8 values that were already handled, beginning the sequence from the enum value regs. You can see why I don't often add narrative explanations of the code in my videos. It takes so long time to explain some trivial bits that when I'm done explaining it, so much more things worth explaining have whistled past that it becomes a losing game trying to explain it all. 
Granted, this is not nearly as bad a program in that regard as the NES emulator was, but this is the reason I don't do it often. There is also the issue that speaking English is difficult for me. It is becoming easier though. One of the reasons that I make these videos is that I get to practice. Practice makes better, they say. Or was it practice makes perfect? Given that the standard internet language is bad English, I am not sure I wish to be perfect in that regard. I hope the copyright mafia won't attack my video with copyright missiles, because I show various anime characters here. The characters really are property of their respective authors. I claim fair use, though. Those images only exist here to illustrate the usefulness of the general purpose 16 color palette. And to show that 2 colors per 3 by 3 square is not that severe restriction as it sounds. At least if you got plenty of time to pre-calculate your images. Sprites, not to be confused with the beverage trademark or with folklore, are a very useful technique to introduce motion into two-dimensional programs. A very familiar type of a sprite is the mouse cursor that is probably hovering over the seek bar of this video right now. Sprites are drawn on top of the background image and they can be moved around. Moving them restores the background image that was hidden under them. OpenMP is a multi-language extension standard for threading support supported by GCC and many other compilers. OpenMP makes it very easy to quickly take advantage of multiple cores in certain types of code. While I have been using OpenMP many times behind the scenes for making these videos, this is probably the first time it appears on screen. I have written an article about OpenMP teaching the basics and going even beyond. Go and read it. You can find the link in the video description. Anyway, we have now reached the point in time where the program can be compiled and tested. The STD equals C++11 option is very important. Without it, the program will not compile. In addition, I'm using several compiler options which enable a large set of warnings. It is always recommended to use these warning options. Compiler warnings can help you find out things that are wrong in your code, either causing malfunctions or just making it ugly to maintain. The FOpenMP option is needed for OpenMP support, without it the OpenMP directives get ignored. I don't know who created this Pac-Man clone for the DCPU. I just downloaded it from a web page that has another DCPU16 emulator on it. You can find it linked in the video description. The iconic sound effects are missing because this hardware has no sound support. Additionally, the game doesn't keep track of score or lives. This is just the programmer having been lazy. In any case, this proves that this first emulator created in little over 7 minutes in fact works. Now, just a moment ago when I launched the Pac-Man game, I loaded a binary format RAM dump from the disk, much like you would do with a ROM for a game console or with an EXE file in Microsoft Windows. However, the preferred format of the distribution of DCPU programs is not a pre-compiled binary, but an assembler source code file. This is a great thing, I applaud this phenomenon. To that end, I will add an assembler in this program, which translates the DCPU assembler source code into machine code. You could say this is extra neos, but hey, it's what every other DCPU emulator does, so I'm doing that too. Besides, without an assembler, I can't test any DCPU programs that I find in the internet. Even the Pac-Man binary that I just loaded was actually assembled with the previous version of this program. This typecast operator syntax is weird. The double ampersand here is not a logical AND operator, but a method qualifier which says that this method can only be called in a R-value reference context. 
I won't explain in this video what an R value reference is, for words defy me at explaining it succinctly enough. But suffice to say that it's something that was introduced in the C11 standard. Now, I confess outright that this assembler will not be particularly pretty code. I almost added it in hindsight and I wanted to make it happen using as little code as possible. It did not happen in as little code as I hoped. It's always the smallest things that demand the greatest effort. But to compensate I added plenty of comments, much more so than in my typical code, which should still make for an entertaining read. In this assembler I took many shortcuts to syntax validation. Basically it presupposes that the code that it is reading is actually valid. Any errors in the assembler code syntax will be handled in ways that are probably weird, broken, unintuitive or all of above. An example of such a case that I ran into was when you put a column after an identifier as opposed to putting it before it, or when you tack a column into an identifier in a non-label context. Try it. Extraneous commas will silently cause odd things to happen as well. The assembler will appear to calculate mathematical expressions properly, but only within certain limits. As long as you only use plus or minus, things are fine. If you add an asterisk for multiplying a value, somewhat simplified precedence rules will be applied. And you can't overwrite the precedence with parentheses. But it turns out that these restrictions are perfectly fine for all the test programs that I downloaded and run, I think. The assembler deals with three kinds of concepts. First is special characters such as commas and new lines. They were dealt with in the parse code function you saw earlier. Then comes identifiers. An identifier is anything that begins with an alphabet and continues with alphanumeric characters. Identifiers fall into two categories, reserved words and non-reserved words. Reserved words are assembler commands like move, set, add, and also register names like a, b, and sp. Anything else is a non-reserved word. Reserved words fall into two categories, instructions and operands. They are handled differently. Non-reserved words have just one category, operands. Operands together form an expression, as in a mathematical expression. The values are added together where possible, and when all the identifiers are resolved, the integer value can be inserted into the machine code. For example, if your assembler code has the expression start plus 10, and you know start has the value 500, you know the expression can be shortened into a single integer with value 510, because 500 plus 10 equals 510. The operand may also include CPU register names, which must be taken care of separately. This flush operand function will produce all the various encodings necessary for a value in the DCPU16 instruction. To simplify an expression, all of the identifiers in the expression must be resolved. This function simplify expression is actually called in two contexts. The first one is from within flush operand, where it doesn't matter if the identifiers are not resolvable at the moment. The second one is at the end of the assembly, where all the expressions that could not be previously resolved completely must be revisited and checked whether the remaining identifiers have all been defined. The simplify expression function resolves all those identifiers that can be resolved and adds their values together and multiplies the different terms where necessary. In other words, it provides expression simplification. Because the instruction set of the DCPU16 is so small, there are many combinations of operands that just cannot be synthesized at all. Actually, it's not a matter of instruction set being small, but the number of addressing modes is small. After all, the instruction set of the 8086 
from which modern-day Pentium and Core 2 processors are inherited was not small by any means, but its set of addressing modes was still minuscule. Anyway, it's a matter of good usability to detect these situations and to tell the user about these errors where they happen. I'm just glad I didn't decide to try and make an 8086 assembler for a YouTube video. Man, that would have been boring to watch. Now that I think it though, it would probably have been pretty much similar to this one though. Just a dozen more lookup tables, but the design of this assembler is rather extensible, now that I think of it. In the 8086, the main complication comes from that the same instruction, such as move, can be encoded in many different ways depending on its parameters. Even for the same parameters, there can be multiple different encodings, and the assembler ideally chooses the most optimal one for each situation. In the IA32, especially if you go for 64-bit code, you have probably about six different ways of encoding move EAX, 0. For the DCPU16, the only option of choice regarding the instruction encoding comes from whether you want to use the small immediate or large immediate format. Well, technically you could also encode X in brackets as X plus zero in brackets, but this wouldn't count as the same instruction in my opinion because it executes in a different number of clock cycles. The last part of the assembly process is indeed the resolving of the forward references, i.e. those identifiers that were used before their address was known, such as forward jumps. Now to be fair, I add a disassembler too. This disassembler will be much much shorter than the assembler. And sorry guys and girls, I will not explain how it works. In fact, to direct attention away from this shoddy code, I will just type it particularly fast now, so we can move on and concentrate on more interesting things. First though, adding those few places in the code where the disassembler might be called. Alright, now that the long and arduous part is done, let's concentrate on the graphics output once more. This time I will add the text mode support. Like the graphics, the text is also rendered into the 128 by 96 pixel buffer, and it uses a 16 color palette. In this buffer, when you use a 4 by 8 font size, you can fit 32 characters horizontally and 12 characters vertically. Because 4 times 8 equals 32, the font for each character fits in a single 32-bit integer. Now it is the time to compile and run the updated program. Let's feed the program this demo that I found in the internet. In the demo you can see an example of text rendering, examples of mixing together all the pairs of colors from the palette, and some examples of rendering familiar and less familiar pictures using dithering. Two Pac-Man sprites are also displayed on the screen all the time for some reason, possibly to demonstrate the sprites. Now so far what I created was an emulator for the older version of the DCPU16 standard, version 1.1. The newest version however happens to be version 1.7. It includes several changes that I have helpfully highlighted in different colors on the documentation you see on the right, mostly red. Again, I am sorry if you are colorblind. I didn't think of colorblind people when I colorized the document. The green and red might particularly be difficult to distinguish from each other's. One of the important changes to the instruction set is that the push and pop operands are now encoded as the same value, and are only distinguished by context. This gave room for a new stack relative addressing mode indicated by the peak keyword. The range of small literals was also shifted down by one, enabling an efficient encoding of the number of minus one. The order of the operands was changed to The right hand side of the expression, i.e. the source expression, is assembled before the left hand side, i.e. the target expression, which necessitates the assembler to remember both operands at the same time. 
One of the things that also changed was that the instruction length changed from 4 bits to 5 bits, allowing 32 different basic instructions instead of 16. Conversely, the length of the B operand shrank from 6 bits into 5 bits, which has the practical meaning that small immediates are no longer possible as the target operand, which wouldn't make sense anyway, so it was a wise change. Now I'm doing something that I should probably have done in the first place, using the rec specs array to facilitate the interpretation of the values rather than using a switch case. While this results in slower code than the other alternative, it does reduce the amount of information repetition in the source code. After this comes the addition of the new instructions. First, changing the order of the operands, the B operand is now the target and the A operand is the source. This change is done into every single This change is done into every single existing instruction. After that I can go ahead and add the new instructions. First, there is ADX and SBX, which supposedly are to help with additions and subtractions of larger than 16-bit numbers. Then comes MLI, DVI, MDI and ASR, which do various operations using signed numbers rather than unsigned ones. Then adding the new IF operations and the new STI and STD operations, which do storing and incrementing at the same time, useful in many kinds of situations, usually involving copying data. The new non-basic instructions will be added as stubs at this point. Now let's get back to the assembler again. My assembler was so far what you would call in Finnish a karvalakki malli. There is actually an article in the English Wikipedia of this term karvalakki, K-A-R-V-A-L-A-K-K-I, if you are interested in seeing what it means. The first thing that I add is support for string constants, so you can easily add text in your programs. Each character of the string constant is added as a numeric operand, as if they were in fact typed separately. Then adding support for defines. A define is like a single line macro. It substitutes the define name for the define contents. With define you can add new commands, such as by saying that RTS will be a shorthand for set PC, pop. Or that jump is a shorthand for set PC, common. Define can also be used to make numeric constants, so that instead of repeating a magic hexadecimal number all around in your code, you can say video RAM is at address 8000, and then use the name video RAM everywhere in your code instead of the number 8000. It makes the assembler code so much easier to maintain. The primary reason why I am adding support for the define is because it's necessary for some of the example programs to work later on in this video. The define will be a so-called meta command, because it's a command that controls how commands are interpreted. And it's not a command or an instruction itself. I will also add a few other meta commands while I am at it. The meta commands all begin with a period or a hash sign. One of these other meta commands is dot .fill. It duplicates the following data a specified number of times, making it easy to create fixed size arrays. The dot .org meta command was not used in any of the examples, but I think adding it might be a good thing as well. It changes the assembler's target address. The macro meta command is the most complicated one that I'm going to add. A macro is basically a multi-line defined with parameters. It looks much like a procedure or a function in imperative languages, except that it is completely based on text substitution, indeed much like define. You can use the macro to define complicated sequences of commands that you use over and over again, such as saving and restoring a set of registers, or calling a function with certain parameters in certain registers, or as a shortcut to certain mathematical operations that are synthesized with multiple instructions. Saves you from having to type the same sequence of commands over and over again. In this assembler, the macro is saved as a set of parameter names and the macro contents. The macro contents are saved as text, with no interpretation whatsoever. 
the contents end with the end macro command. The downside of this simple method is that macro definitions cannot be nested. When the macro is called, each of the macro parameters becomes a new define of their own for the duration of the macro call. Some rather ugly exceptions are required in the parsing code to make sure that some parsing logic is suppressed while the macro is being recorded. Conversely, because that parsing logic happens to be disabled, the end macro directive has to be detected with a different way. Yeah, I did say it's ugly. Finally, adding the include meta command, which works much like the include meta command works in C, Quick Basic, or many other languages. When the include meta command is detected, the next string constant will be interpreted as a file name which will be parsed as if it was actually inserted at that point in the original file. This includes can actually be nested so that an included file can further include more files. Anyway, now it is the time to test the program again. I will just quickly show that Pac-Man still runs even though the instructions that was upgraded to DCPU 1.7. That's because at a simpler level it's still the same language even though the coding for those instructions is very much different from what it was before. Now I will add those interrupt control instructions. And hey, the documentation is back! Once again you can actually understand what I'm doing. Maybe now I can shut up for a moment, which would be great news for me because making this narration has taken me about 9 days so far, and I still have about one third of the video to go. I'm not a very talkative person normally, I much prefer to type. Apologies if the text on the right is too small to read. I did provide this video in HD though, so please take advantage of that option if that is available to you. It's just that when I was doing the editing of the source code, I did not remember to leave room on the right for the documentation. So when I added the documentation there in post process, I had to make it small so as not to significantly overlap with the source code. Unlike probably every other processor platform in the existence, the DCPU 16 version 1.7 has these two kinds of interrupts. Interrupts that the CPU itself but especially the hardware can fire towards the CPU to notify it of special events and interrupts that the CPU can fire towards hardware components. The hardware components themselves are enumerated and all follow a standard interface. They have an ID number, a version number and a manufacturer code, which can be queried from the hardware for identification. In addition, they can receive interrupts as explained before. The first device supported by this emulator is the hardware clock. You can see the entire specification of the clock in the upper right corner of this video. With the clock, programs running on the DCPU can accomplish periodic tasks, whatever they might be, for example keeping track of time. The clock device runs at 60Hz rate that may be divided by any integer factor. For example, if the divider is 60, the clock will tick exactly once per second. When the clock ticks, it may generate an interrupt to the CPU, causing the CPU to execute the interrupt handler indicated by its IA register. This is how the application may keep track of time. Next up is the hardware monitor, or new Electriska Low Energy Monitor, LEM1802. Again, in the upper right corner of the screen you can see the technical specification of the programming interface of the device. The LEM1802 sadly only supports a text mode and not a graphics mode at all, but its font and the palette can be customized at runtime, which is good. A clever programmer might even use these aspects to provide graphical features. Someone even did make a pixel graphics editor for this device. The screen for the LEM1802 refreshes at a 60Hz rate, just like the clock. This is not actually written in the documentation, which I find a bit odd. The documentation probably assumes that every change to the screen is instantaneous. My emulator will however update at 60Hz rate, which will then get halved for YouTube, unfortunately because YouTube caps the frame rate at 30 silently dropping anything rendered at faster rate than that. 
The text rendering is almost identical to what it was previously, but the font is stored in a different format and thus has to be rewritten. A portion of this data, which represents the built-in font as hexadecimal numbers or bit masks, is obscured by the documentation, sorry about that, but I don't expect there to be a single viewer that derives any fascination or interest from those numbers, which is why I also had them typed so fast. A change in the order of the bits in the font necessitates this change in the pixel extraction formula from the font characters. Now the RGB colors in the palette were also changed from 24 bit into 12 bit or from 8 bits per component into 4 bits per component, which means that the true color rendering must be changed too. The palette is also accessed through an assisting function now instead of through indexing an array. The third and final device that gets added will be the keyboard. The keyboard maintains buffer typed keys of unspecified size and can report which keys are being held down at a given time. Any time a change happens in the keys that are down or up or a keyboard auto-repeat kicks in, an interrupt will be fired towards the CPU. The documentation doesn't say what exactly should be placed in the keyboard buffer. My emulator places in the buffer just the typed keys, i.e. the key code when the key is pressed down or repeated, but some of them, such as ox10c.de, also put the key in the buffer when the key is released. There are a few such oversights in the Muyang documentation overall. In my emulator, the keyboard events are checked 50 times in a second, which should be sufficient enough for most purposes. The keyboard supports all the typed ASCII characters, and additionally a few special keys, such as the arrow keys or the shift and control keys. Some emulators extend this set with some additional keys, and I am doing that too. I am adding the escape button with the key number 1. Um, sorry, not 1, but 27. Misremembered that one. Finally, adding some glued logic to patching for the deficiencies of the SDL library, because it doesn't give all the information that we need at the time when we need it, and we thus need to save the information when it was still available, so that it can be used when it is no longer available and rewriting the CPU tick function to call the tick methods for each hardware device. But once that is done, we can get ready to observe and potentially admire or possibly reproach the finished emulator. First, when we run the Pac-Man game, we can quickly notice that it no longer runs. Or rather, it runs but because the display and keyboard hardware is different, it is utterly non-playable. So instead, I launched the kernel that actually runs. This is a translation of the Commodore Business Machine's basic kernel, ported for the DCPU16 by what appears to be a quite experienced programmer, by the Nick Pentomino or the name Nick Benzema. As you see, it is almost identical to Commodore 64, and this is no coincidence. It is the same software after all, just with some work put to it. This distribution includes some prepackaged programs that you can try for fun, but for some reason they don't appear to run as they should. I'm not sure where the bug is. After the very extensive testing that I subjected my emulator to before making this video, I would like to say that the bug is in his code, but you never know. At least you get to see the iconic syntax error message in its original context. It just happens to be given here without an apparent good reason. The most well-known DCPU16 kernel, however, probably is Atlas OS. I don't quite get the point of Atlas OS, but I believe that it is an incomplete project as is, and uh, that it should not be judged as a complete kernel. In any case, I felt fitting to showcase it in this video as well. The text cursor here appears as a downward arrow, which I think it should not be, but this is probably because the kernel doesn't replace the font with its own one. I am also having trouble typing some commands. 
for some reason some of my key presses keep getting ignored by the OS if I type fast enough. Again, not sure who is to blame here. This happened with the basic interpreter too, so it might be my own code that works wrong here. However, I cannot take the blame for this crash that just happened here. Anyway, this was my DCPU16 emulator. Remember, if you are a beginner, focus on the first 7 minutes of this video, because that's where the emulator call was written. Everything else was just additional features. Thanks for watching, see you next time, bye!